started. I want to welcome everybody who is joining us from home. My name is Carol Grooms, and I'm the current president of the American School Band Directors Association. And it is my pleasure to be here to host this episode of ASBDA's series of interviews with musical icons. And our good friend, supporter of all band directors and music educators everywhere, Robert W. Smith, is here to talk with us. We have four ASBDA members on the panel that will ask questions as well. Bill Witcher, retired ASBDA member from North Carolina. Kathy Wall, who is the regional representative for the western side of the country for ASBDA in Colorado. Chris Simonson, who is the regional representative for our region two up around Wisconsin, Minnesota, up in that neck of the woods. And we have Rich Patterson, one of our past presidents and a very active retired member who's also in Colorado and myself in Tennessee. Um, let me tell you a little about Robert and then we'll get things going here. So, so Robert, I think if anyone said, well, who are you? Your first answer is going to be that you are husband and father and teacher. Absolutely. Before three most anything important else. Roles, three most important roles in my life. And there, that I, I know that to be true. It's a lovely family and just full of music educators who we were just talking about before we started. And Robert is from Dalesville. Dale, is it with an S? Is it Daleville or Dales? It's a singular. Dale, Daleville, singular, okay. Alabama. Yes. yes, I think I was saying it wrong. Daleville, Alabama, which if I remember correctly is near Fort Rucker, kind of down at the bottom of the state, right above the panhandle of Florida. And um, and you've been a Southerner pretty much all your life, even in various parts of the South, right? Absolutely, born born at Fort Rucker, uh, Alabama. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, um, piano was your first instrument mm -hmm. as a as a youngster, and I believe I read that you started playing the trumpet when you were about in the fifth grade or so, and and that you had great musical influences in your family from your mother and your grandmother and others, and um wrote your first compositions as a middle schooler. Now I taught middle school for years and I can imagine this, but somehow I imagine yours were probably pretty good. And you had a great band director who let you play them or play them with the band for you, which is pretty cool. By college, um, Robert had a good side business doing arranging and composing. And by the time he was in college, he already had a job as a band director in a private school. And then upon graduation, which I, if I remember you were younger than typical. Yes, just a um, little bit. <laughs> how old were you when you graduated well, from college? Uh, I, uh, it's a long story. We won't get into all the detail, yeah. but I, I stretched it. I, I, I could have graduated uh, in, at 19, but I stretched it to 20, <laughs> you know? Oh my goodness, I can't imagine. And, and you went to Florida and began your career as a high school band director after that and um so you went to troy state Correct. which is where you now teach troy state university then now we would just call it troy university correct yes yes and and you were director of bands there at one point as well weren't you yes, I in was. the past yeah um got your master's degree in miami and you got to work with alfred reed yes. what a wonderful experience that must have been and um while teaching in florida robert was recruited to work for the publishing arm of Columbia Pictures. And he wrote hundreds and hundreds of compositions and arrangements, which were published over the years. And I know you have a long association with um, Warner Brothers and Barnhouse and possibly others that, that I'm not naming. And now have your own music publishing business, independent RWS Music. Correct. And, and I know that you've been um, involved in Drum and Bugle Corps for many years. Um, a few years ago, I know Robert was working with the Music City Drum and Bugle Corps, which has its winter home at the school where I've taught for many years here in Franklin, Tennessee. And it was fun to, to I'd have to clean my desk a little bit when, when I knew the Drum and Bugle Corps was coming over so folks like Robert could sit at it. So tell us now, and, and I know that our other questions will go back and get in, in a little bit more into your forming years, but now you are head of the music industry program at Troy. And I know people assume that, oh, well, he teaches composition or he's band director, but 
you're head of music industry and, and music business. And tell, tell us what is a, a week in the life of Professor Smith? What kinds of things are you doing and what kind of classes are you teaching and experiences your students are having and so on? What's it like? What are you doing? Well, first off, I am so thankful to Troy University because uh, that single institution has really shaped almost my entire life. From the days of being a young school band member and a musician, a uh, little kid going to watch Dr. John M. Long and the Troy State University Band and watch that icon. We just lost him last year. And uh, just, to, just to see that and, and was so inspired. And then to actually go there and get my undergraduate degree and uh, under Dr. Long, and uh, my first composition teacher was there, Dr. Paul Yoder, if you guys may remember the name Paul Yoder. And uh, so I was so thankful that Dr. Long made that connection and all the wonderful people that came through there. I got to play principal trumpet on two albums for Golden Crest under the baton of William Ravelli. You know, we recorded two albums there. The, the list goes on and on. It was such an impactful experience. When Dr. Long retired in 1997, I got a call that said, would you consider uh, applying for the position and I was it was at a time in my life when it was time for me to start heading back home I had some family I had to take care of and reconnect and and whatnot so uh, I applied and I uh, became Dr. Long's successor so I became the director of bands at Troy State University and uh, and uh, I was there while I was there uh, several people including our Chancellor Jack Hawkins who is I believe if he isn't the longest serving chancellor in America, it's close to the longest serving. He's been with us 34 years and uh, a great visionary and one of the greatest uh, leaders and, uh, that I've ever had the pleasure to work with. And I say that very, very sincerely. I was asked, what, do, what will it take to grow and what will it take to our school of music? So I had the opportunity to conceive of a music industry program. I'm, I've been, I'm spent a, a large part of my life now is trying to connect the music industry with music education. Because here in the United States, we do something nobody else does in the world. We have music education for all, and it is compulsory at the, at the elementary levels. And uh, so if we can connect our music industry with our music education community, we will all grow exponentially. In fact, I tell people if you walk into the band room or the choir room or the orchestra room, the only thing that's education in there is the flesh and blood. Everything else in there came from the music industry, the instruments, the stands, the chairs, uh, the music that they're playing, it came from the industry. So we've got a partner. And uh, so that's been a big passion of mine. I got to create the music industry program. And I designed that program, uh, got it into the proposal process, and then I had an offer from uh, uh, Warner Brothers uh, that is one of those that I couldn't refuse. And so uh, I went to the chancellor and literally said, Chancellor, sir, I've got to go do this. And uh, he said, okay. And, uh, uh, and so five years when it was done, they asked me back. And they said, you know that uh, music industry program? And I, well, we need somebody now to come and run it. Uh, would, are you in a position to come back? And I was thrilled to go home, let me tell you. And uh, so since uh, the fall of 2006, I'm the coordinator of the music industry program. What does that mean? It's a little music biosphere where I, yes, I, I do teach composition, but I'm teaching, uh, I'm teaching writers, composers, but I'm also teaching them to record their music and I'm teaching them to score films and television. Uh, so to take the composition, not just for the live stage, but for all forms of media. I teach songwriters. Uh, yes, I, I'm very comfortable with music technology, so I'm fortunate, but I've, we've been able to hire some really wonderful faculty members uh, with us. So we've got uh, multiple faculty members that teach on the music technology sides of things. So I teach the creative side at Troy uh, of the music industry and getting music out to the world, and then I also teach the business courses. And then I've got f colleagues that are teaching the other side of the fence, which which is the technical side, and we meet in the middle and call it production. And I'm very fortunate it's blown up from just an idea, and I'm literally dealing with about 140 students in our program, and they literally now come from around the world. And uh, we're making a mark, you know. Uh, I, I have students that, you know, music you hear now every single day. We have students that won CMAs, Carol, from there in Nashville now. Uh, I've got a student that graduated. By the way, she was the head majorette in the band, but she's a composer. And she is now writing and scoring for the children's show Veggie Tales. 
Okay, there's a gentleman, a wonderful gentleman there uh, that handles that uh, in Nashville named Kurt Heineke. What a wonderful, wonderful, talented man. But uh, Jesselyn, the majorette, is a composer for Veggie Tales, and she's about to have her first orchestra works published. I'm so thrilled, as one example. So that's what I do at Troy, and, uh, and I, I interact with the band. I'm in great support of Dr. Mark Walker, and uh, we're great collaborators, and I just love the band. And uh, I go to every football game and I sit there in my seats and cheer, and uh, he asked me to write something I'm happy to write for the band. But it's a, it's a wonderful life. In my 60s now, I, I have no desire to go anywhere else. I love Troy. That's terrific. It's, it's a, such a different angle of your life. You're, you've done many, many different things. I think one of the most versatile and um, uh, flexible people I know of in, in our world in music education. So I can't wait to hear more. Bill, would you like to ask a question? Sure. Robert, it's so wonderful to have you with us tonight and uh, share your life story and uh, uh, what you've done for music education. You know, we've all had those people that we refer to that that we stood on their shoulders, so to speak. And uh, I've had, had me being retired for 15 years. I had this question asked of me a lot, and I refer to people that I stood on the shoulders of giants. But uh, is there? It's impossible for me to name that one person. Uh, sometimes I can get it to about five people or so, but. Do you have that person or a multiple numbers of persons that you can look back on from your childhood, high school career, collegiate career, and even in your professional career that you consider as mentors and heroes that have brought you along? That's a wonderful question. And I think it's so important for us to share our teaching lineage it is so incredible because when I, when I work with my students, there is no telling what nuggets I may share with them and where they came from back through that lineage. So to answer your question, I owe first off everything to my mother and grandmother because they got me so interested in music and we lived in such a musical uh, environment. And I grew up, uh, my grandmother, uh, those of you in the deep south, there's a couple of you in here would can relate to this, or at least uh, Carol can and, uh, and Bill can. My grandmother was the organist in the Baptist church for 40 plus years. And uh, so I grew up in the Daleville Baptist Church. And I got to tell you, some of my fondest childhood memories are playing offertory with her. I'm on piano, she's on organ. Or after I started playing the trumpet, I played a trumpet solo and she would accompany me on organ. But, but their, their influence was huge. In fact, I, I was so enthralled with it that uh, I wanted to take piano lessons so bad. And I literally, just, my mom tells me I just sat there and cried because I, 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 I couldn't uh, take piano lessons. My mom took me to a very, very influential woman by the name of Joan Marchman. And she was my first piano teacher. And she literally said, when he's five, I'll take him. And so on my fifth birthday, I went to that front door. I can still see it. And I knocked on the door and said, Ms. Marchman, today's my birthday and I'm five. And I started piano lessons. This, what she did for me now is unfathomable. Here I am at this, at this opposite end of life now, looking back at that. I knew I could probably pass the freshman theory final exam at Troy University when I was seven or eight years old. Uh, that's not because of me, it's because of this very gifted teacher. She started me as a composer. All right, Robert, here, start writing. In fact, when I turned 40, my mother said, Robert, it's time for you to have this now. And my birthday gift was a little manuscript book. And I opened it up and I it looked vaguely familiar. I opened it up and it was melodies that I had written when I was five, six, and seven years old in my hand. And I, I, I sat there and I looked at it and I went, oh my God, I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at some child. You know, this is, I've, I've long since left that life. But you know what? I could read it and the form was right. There was form, there was melody, there was contour, there was shape, there was question, there was answer, there was tension, there was resolution. And, and, and she did that for me. And yet gave me the technique I needed, but gave me the wherewithal uh, to audiate in a way that I found out late. I thought everybody did this. I, I have a, I, I've been very blessed with a pretty good ear. I thought everybody could tell you what the pitch was. 
I didn't know that till I was 12 or 13, that everybody couldn't hear that. Uh, so that was unbelievably significant to me. When I got into fifth grade, though, I joined the band. And all of a sudden, I'd been living in a black and white world. And all of a sudden, it's like the scene in Wizard of Oz where it goes into color. Oh, my goodness. And the world opened up. And I had a really wonderful gentleman by the name of Don Tillery who started me uh, on trumpet. And I took lessons from, I, I grew up, I was born on Fort Rucker, Alabama, so the 98th Army Band. Warren Johnson was the principal trumpet player in that Army Band, and he took me and gave me trumpet lessons. And so I was so very fortunate there. But it was the, the arrival of a very special teacher yet again, Dr. Clifford M. Winter. In Alabama, they know him as Ski Winter. And uh, it was his first job out of college, and he showed up, and I'm in the band room. And uh, we became fast friends, and he was a trumpet player, so he started teaching me trumpet lessons and, and, and whatnot. And I, our band was sounding better than ever, and I just couldn't believe that our, our little band in Daleville, Alabama, was sounding that good. And I went to him one day, and I said, you know, Mr. Winter, I want, let's play this, let's play this. He said, okay, Robert, you write it. And that was on a Friday. So I spent all weekend writing. And then I turned around and delivered score and parts on Monday morning, and he played it. And that started something that was uh, priceless for me. He encouraged me to write, and every time I wrote, he stopped what he was doing and he played it. So I got instant feedback. And that feedback is different than composers of today because the computer spits it out today. I was actually be able, I was able to hear acoustic balance. I was able to hear voicing in a way. I was able to hear that a woodwind instrument is not quite as strong as a brass instrument, so I have to voice this differently. And I was aware of this in middle school. By the time I hit eighth grade, I started writing all the marching band shows, and, and here we go, and, 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 and life became really good. So I owe the world to Dr. Clifford M. Winter and his wife, Suzanne Winter. They're retired now. They live just south of, uh, of Birmingham, Alabama, but I owe them the world. Also, Dr. John M. Long and the influence, because he was Dr. Winter's, uh, he was Dr. Winter's and Mrs. Winter's teacher. By the way, he was the director of the School of Music at Troy State University. He, he was also the dean, and uh, he was responsible for even Joan Marchman's, uh, my, my piano teacher's education and that environment. So his influence as an umbrella throughout my entire life has been significant. But then when I was his student and I joined the band, and uh, I, I literally, he tells, you know, he still remembers the day I met him. I was 11 or 12 years old. I shook his hand. I said, no, Dr. Long, I'm, I'm going to play trumpet in your band one day. And he, he tells the story. He said, no, son, you're going to be my principal trumpet player. And uh, I ended up being his principal trumpet player. And his influence was amazing. And the people he exposed me to, the William Ravellis, the Sir Vivian Dunns, the Paul Yoders, the Harry Beegians, the list goes on and on and on. And there are almost too many to list. So his influence is beyond belief. And of course, Dr. Yoder at the undergrad level. Then at the master's level, I studied with Alfred Reed. I was in Alfred Reed's program at the University of Miami. And uh, uh, I'm living his life now. He started at ABC in New York and, and uh, was an incredible orchestrator, composer. Of course, a lot of his writing started when he was in the uh, military bands, uh, uh, particularly even in World War II. Russian Christmas music was written during World War II, for example. Uh, but then he started teaching at the University of Miami. And he, by the way, was the first to put in a music industry program at the collegiate level, which I now have followed in his footsteps. And so I've installed one here along with some colleagues, uh, particularly Dr. Larry Blocker here, and, uh, and, and we've done that here at Troy. So the influence of Dr. Alfred Reed is unbelievable. And then you did mention in, in life, I do need to mention one more. There are so many, uh, that, but, but there's a gentleman, Dr. Jack Bullock. He is still with us. Uh, I will turn 63 uh, next Sunday. Dr. Jack Bullock is 30 years older than I am, so he's 93. Uh, he is still with us, but he is that music educator that was at Columbia Pictures that hired me. And he was teaching at Ithaca College up in New York and then took the job uh, to develop the concert band orchestra catalog at Columbia Pictures Publications. He found me and mentored me and has been not just a lifelong mentor, but also a lifelong friend. So sorry for the long-winded answer there, Bill, but uh, I, I, I think that all of us are prisms and we reflect multiple colors from multiple experiences in our life. And uh, now I share with all my students my lineage, and I do go back to Joan Marchman because one of my prized possessions is my teaching tree. 
that she literally took one of my music books, hard hardbound music book, she knew I would keep it, and she in her hand she wrote down my teaching tree. So it starts with me and it goes to Joan Marchman, but over here it works its way to Percy Granger. It works its way to Beethoven. It works its way to Mozart. It works its way to Franz Liszt. And so who knows what kernels we're passing on, and it is that long teaching tree that has to be constantly nurtured and fertilized and grown and cared for. Even during the winter season when it looks like it's not doing well, we have to care for it because we know spring is going to be here once again. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Those are wonderful tributes. I think none of us, particularly in the music profession, could ever say we could find that one person. It is a, it's a continuum of people that have been influenced, that have influenced us greatly. So thank you. That's wonderful. I thank think you. we're going to turn this over to Chris now. Chris, you're up. Thank you, Bill. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to be here, Robert. It's, it's really special. You had uh, just mentioned Columbia Pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, what's, what are some of the things that you wrote at Columbia Pictures? Uh, is there anything we might recognize now? And what were some of the unique experiences that you had when you were working uh, for the folks at Columbia? Uh, great question. Uh, at Columbia, uh, Dr. Jack Bullock found me, and he was looking for somebody. They were building an educational catalog at Columbia Pictures Publications. Now, Columbia Pictures had come out of screen gyms. Uh, the gentleman that was running that, uh, you would all know, by the way, we just lost him this last year. His name was Frank J. Hackinson. You would know him as FJH Music. All right, and there is a connection there. We can come back to it, but uh, literally about 25 years ago, Frank called me. He said, Robert, I'm looking for the young you. All right, you, you remember when you walked into my office, who have you got that I could build yet a new company on called FJH Music? And I gave him my student, Brian Balmages. And Brian uh, was uh, uh, spent four years with me at James Madison University and sitting right next to him for anybody into the orchestra world was young Soon He Newbold. And if you're into orchestra and particularly string orchestra, you know who Soon He is. Those were my students. And like those folks did with me, I shared everything with them. And I'm still so closely connected with them as I am multiple composers. I have, a, I have two generations of composers now that are students and, and, and of mine behind me and also multiple grandchildren with students of my students. So, uh, so I'm, I'm the old man on the block now. But uh, at Columbia Pictures, Frank, Frank hired me. Jack was my direct supervisor and our job was to build this educational catalog. So I came in and, and Jack meeting me, I had two responsibilities. He knew that I had some marching band chops. Uh, I had done marching band and uh, done some drum corps and I understood and uh, uh, how all that worked. And so I handled the marching band, their very first marching band catalog. So I handled that, but I also handled the opposite end. I handled the orchestra. So I had marching band and orchestra, two opposite ends of the spectrum. And I got to work with some really great people on both sides. On the orchestral side, I got to work with some just amazing people. You know, work with the Leroy Anderson estate, uh, to work with uh, H. Owen Reed, you know, La Fiesta Mexicana, you know, and, and my phone calls with H. Owen Reed. What a great, incredible opportunity that was. To be able to work uh, closely and get to know uh, icons like uh, Dave Brubeck, uh, the, jazz, the jazz pianist. He was a very good friend. Uh, and, uh, and his first work for concert band was mine, Dave Brubeck, A Portrait in Time. And uh, so literally, uh, uh, I did that arrangement. I did that arrangement for him with his approval, and he was involved with every bit of that. And I saw him multiple times over the years, and we, and we remained very good friends. Uh, so those were really amazing. I was working on the educational side, but I kind of straddled the fence to popular music and also to film uh, music and television production music because uh, number one I had to help advise because I was the young demographic at that time so when Frank and Jack were looking for somebody who understood what that younger teacher younger uh, younger musicians are gonna be looking for I was able to speak to that clearly and so I'm, I'm thankful that they they valued my opinion uh, but I was able to interface with amazing film composers amazing popular music artists 
uh, I still remember in the 80s, uh, you know, Frank and, and Jack called me and, and, uh, and, and I'm all of a sudden, hey, we got this project. It's a uh, brand new group we're, we're signing here. We're going into a relationship with. They're called the Miami Sound Machine. And uh, that's Gloria Stefan and the Miami Sound Machine. And so I got to work in, uh, with Gloria and Emilio Estefan. Uh, they, Gloria is the one that said, you know, Robert, you know, we, our trumpet player really loves what you do. He's a, he's a music educator. He'd really like to connect with you. We did. And uh, he became one of my best friends in life, and so much so that he was the best man in my wedding. And there's a composer, a ranger by the name of Victor Lopez, if you know Victor Lopez. And uh, I was introduced to Victor Lopez by Gloria Stefan. And, uh, and we, have been, we have stayed so incredibly tight uh, all throughout these years. In fact, I just exchanged emails with him today. You know? so, uh, so I was able to do that and, and, and do some very interesting things. At the same time, I was working, orchestrating, arranging, uh, but Jack and, uh, and, and another gentleman by the name of Jack Lamb, we lost him two years ago. And Jack Lamb, what an incredible impact on my life, but he was my editor, uh, concert band editor, and he also, you would know him as the editor of the Bellwin catalog. And uh, so Jack was an incredible sounding board for me and how he was able to manage my type A personality and me bouncing off the walls with a thousand ideas and him bringing clarity uh, to the ideas and him bringing uh, sanity to the process. Uh, I'll never be able to repay him. But uh, Jack is the one who said, okay, you know, Robert, we've got to find your voice. You know, we've got to find your voice. And they gave me the opportunity to truly start uh, uh, composing and exploring. And so it was in the 80s when that came out. And so finally, probably the piece that arrived was a piece called Encanto. And I actually did that, if you know Encanto. Uh, by the way, that's based on a story, a conversation I had with Victor Lopez. Uh, Victor Lopez is uh, Cuban, American. Victor Lopez was in Cuba, pre-Castro, uh, the Mario boat lift. Victor rode the boats in the Mario boat lift. And I know, and he told me that entire story. On those boats was a very incredible family who gave up their entire business in Havana. They had the, call it the Macy's Bloomingdale's of, 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 of Havana. They gave it all up and uh, they came to Miami with just the clothes that were on their back. And every day going to the University of Miami, I passed their new business. And uh, Victor telling me this story uh, about just finding joy and finding freedom and finding the, the ability to express yourself as you so choose. And so uh, they named, this family named their American business after their old department store in, in Havana. And the name of that business is El Encanto. Encanto. And so I named that band piece after that experience because Victor is the one that told me that story. So that was all in those 80s. During that time at Columbia Pictures, there was a corporate uh, merger. I was still at Columbia Pictures through, through the 80s, but it turned into what some people may remember as CPP Bellwin. That stood for Columbia Pictures Publication slash Bellwin. Frank uh, Hackinson had acquired the Bellwin catalog and we were part of that move. I was part of the part of the move that uh, dealt with getting all that uh, move from uh, Long Island, New York uh, to Miami, Florida. So that was a significant part and again got to work with amazing film composers as well. So the influences were pretty incredible. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Thanks very much. Uh, Kathy, I believe you're next. Yes, sir. Um, Robert, thank you so much for all of your history and so forth. It's just like amazing to hear you speak and so forth. Um, but I have a question. How has your compositions changed or evolved? Knowing, knowing good music is good music, regardless of when it's written. How has it changed or evolved through the years to keep up with and fit the changing of the demographics and young people of today where, you know, every 30 seconds, they, their attention span goes to another level. Has it changed or what have you done to um, keep up with that? Yeah, that's a, a really great question. I'm thankful you asked that. Uh, so I, I have a unique perspective because I've been doing this for now almost 40 years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and we're talking from the publisher's level as well as the writer's level. So I, ha I have a, a, a fairly unique perspective on it. Not many still left in that industry uh, are still working and, and have that same kind of perspective. Uh, speaking as a composer, as, a, as, as somebody that hopefully still has a voice, something that somebody wants to hear, um, my, I like to think of my writing as a constant evolution. And it's a slow evolution. 
Uh, for example, uh, before this call, uh, we were talking about Into the Storm. And, and so there is Into the Storm. I wrote that, I was in Virginia, I was teaching at James Madison University, and there was a blizzard. Uh, you remember the storm of the century in 1993? Okay, well I wrote it during the storm of the century. I was living in my little house up on the hill, three and a half feet of snow fell at my, my house. I felt like I was in one of my, I love snow globes, those little glass orbs you, with a scene in it, you shake it and watch the, 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 the snow and the storm underneath. I felt like I was living in a snow globe. And I was getting ready. I was working on a commission for an honor band. And I, and, uh, I said, what am I going to write about? I'm going to write about what I'm living and experiencing right now. So, yes, I rode into the storm. And that thing begins with three shakes of the snow globe. Ding, ding, ding. And all of a sudden, jump, bum, bum, bum. and all of a sudden the storm is unleashed. And like anything else, there's a period of calm because a, a true blizzard is a hurricane below freezing. And there's a period of calm in the middle. Then the back half of the storm comes back even stronger. So those of you that may know that composition, uh, that was true inspiration at the moment. However, the teacher in me went, you know, there's a lot of teaching here. There's a lot of teaching. And really good teaching means that we do have to, we have to spiral, we have to teach in a helix, we have to introduce a concept and we have to come back and reinforce that concept. And then we have to introduce it again at a much broader level so that we're creating depth in, in the fabric of our students' educational experiences. So I thought, you know, there's something about Into the Storm that students really seem to like. So why don't I introduce this at a beginning band level? So I wrote a piece called The Tempest. And the two of them are designed to be taught in an educational sequence. So a middle school, beginning band or middle school group can play The Tempest, and then we can get into advanced middle school and, and high school and play into the storm. And we're able to introduce even more cons more musical content, techniques, skills, uh, within a context that we can build upon and scaffold upon. Michael, much like we stand on shoulders of giants, we teach on the levels of scaffolding that have come before us. And uh, for me as an as a educator, for us, I think our, one of our biggest challenges is making sure the scaffolding of our K-12 system is strong and connected. There's still an abyss between the elementary school and the middle school. And there's still an abyss somewhat between the middle school and the high school. So I like to think of my, my pieces evolving. There are some though, Kathy that, Kathy, that go, you know, I'm not sure, you know, you couldn't come up with a new idea there. Why, why are you just repeating yourself? No, there's an educational reason that I did that. I do want to point out, in 1996, I wrote a piece. It was a commission for one of the United States Air Force bands. I wrote a piece called 12 Seconds to the Moon. I don't know how many of you are familiar with 12 Seconds to the Moon. And uh, it's very hard. It's grade 6 plus. I still remember getting the, the purchase order from the uh, Air Force Pentagon. And uh, they literally wanted, uh, you know, here's, here's everything that needs to happen in this. And they wanted it at a grade six plus so that those professional musicians would have to practice. And uh, so I thought that was really quite hysterical. So I wrote 12 Seconds to the Moon. And that was inspiration. I wrote it. It was brand new. I did something rather, rather uh, uh, controversial, particularly in, 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 in publishing, particularly music dealer circles. They were incensed that I put in two piano parts two piano parts, because nobody has two piano players, nobody even has a piano player. I, I respectfully disagree. I think there are pianists and there are musicians running around our schools that are not in our band rooms, our choir rooms, our orchestra rooms. I think they are there, and I knew that. Now I do understand having two grand pianos is one thing, but it was done also, you could do it electronically as well. But I still remember that that, that came as such a shock, it was such a new sound that it took a long time for that uh, to kind of catch on. So for me, that evolution becomes really important in terms of creativity. Uh, to bring this portion of the question uh, uh, to conclusion, I'm in, I'm in uh, the 1980s. I'm back, uh, uh, I'm back at my time with Columbia Pictures. I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm getting ready to record with the Washington Winds. The morning was free. There was a, the National Gallery of Art was having an exhibit featuring on the works of Henri Matisse, the impressionistic painter. Now, truth be known, my father was military. I lived four years in France as a child. And I have been to the Louvre many times, and I have seen, I saw as a young child, the paintings of Matisse. 
and I, was, I can still see them through those young four and five year old eyes. The colors were amazing to me. So here I am in DC and they had a, an exhibition. And so I, I wanted to go see them again and they were there. Many of the campuses I had seen literally 25 years earlier, 20, 20 plus years earlier in my life. So I went and they had one series in a circle. And in that circle, uh, what had happened is Matisse would come in, he brought in a beautiful model, he's on the south of France, he literally painted a beautiful scene, the window was open, you could see the Mediterranean outside, the light was perfect. He painted a beautiful scene, but then what he did the next day is he brought the same model back at a different time of day, dressed the same way, and he tried it from a different perspective. And the third day he did it again from a different perspective with different light. And the fourth day, and the fifth day, and the sixth day. When he was done, he was done with a series of paintings. And you know what? The first painting wasn't the best. He had to explore it. And so with my young composition students, they may have an idea they're using, but they may want to explore that in other ways for in, in compositions, additional compositions. Um, I'll, I'll give one more example. Uh, musicians, particularly pianists, may be familiar with Be uh, Beethoven's Diabelli Variations. Diabelli was an Austrian publisher. He had an idea. He was dealing with the greatest composers in the world at his, in, at his time. And uh, his idea was Diabelli wrote a simple little theme and then he sent it out to all his composers. Said, please write a setting of this. And so he was to bring it in and uh, then he, with them all starting with the same source material, he thought he would be able to see and hear the differences between the composers. Well, Beethoven was incensed. He was not happy about doing this, but he wrote, the, he wrote one. And then he went, hmm, he wrote a second, and he wrote a third, and he wrote a fourth. Thirty some odd variations later, it's a masterwork for piano, piano by Beethoven called the Diabelli Variations. And every 10 years, I listen to that over and over again. And I pick up additional fragment, a fragment he may have started in variation five, comes to full fruition six or seven variations later. You can hear that slow evolution. So Kathy, there's a long answer to this, but I've experienced doing something really quick and starkly different. And then I've also experienced the evolving. I like to think that creativity is evolving process. At the same time, the other half of your question was, what has happened with bands? and what has happened with our, uh, our, 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 our music ed settings. I tell students now that when I graduated college with my degree in music education, and I'm going to be a young band director, there was a very good chance that the band was still going to be in the same state it was by the time I hit my 60s and I retire. Well, I'm knocking on that door now. The reality is it didn't make it that long. We have concert bands. They're kind of the same but the percussion is drastically different. The use of keyboard percussion, the timbres that we're using, all right, we're like a chef who's found new spices. It's drastically different. Electronics are involved, and, and yes, even in the concert band. Uh, to, to get a harp part, we're probably going to use, not very many of us have a harpist available, much less the instrument itself. So we may be using electronics. What I do know is that young teacher now who is graduating the chances of it being here for 40 years in their career are slim. It's going to be morphing. We didn't plan on things like pandemics. We had an evolution of, of the instrumentation of the concert band, and we changed things. We became the Americanized sound really uh, highlights the woodwinds in a really beautiful way, as opposed to maybe the European Germanic Wagnerian brass uh, kind of focus. And we use woodwinds in a completely different way. Well, that's been a slow evolution over the years. Now throw the American percussion in on top of that. Now throw something like our pandemic on top of that and then realize that a significant amount of our literature, uh, we, many of us cannot play because we don't have the instrumentation. So now we're having to evolve yet again. It's a paradigm shift to create uh, new works or reset older works, master works in flexible instrumentation. So evolution is the only thing that is consistent. How's that for a contradictory philosophical statement? I think that's wonderful and great insight for all of us to think about. So, and, and hearing the history of that and how, how you've evolved 
from your beginning, knowing that it's um, wonderful music, but how you've changed through it is is wonderful. I'd like to thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to uh, pass this on to my fellow uh, Colorado member, Rich Patterson, um, for his next question, for our next question. Thank you. Hi, Robert. You've been active as a speaker in music education circles, educating band directors about the copyright law and the importance of purchasing music. In other words, not copying it illegally. And there's also the issue of getting advanced permissions before using copyrighted works on audio or video programs that have been uh, recorded over the years. Band directors awareness, I think of right and wrong here has increased uh, say in the last 20 years, but what do you think are the biggest current challenges that remain for band directors and teachers in following the copyright law? What do you see as potential solutions? Uh, great question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, I will start by just offering a simple mission statement as educators. We must value what we teach. We're here because of the music. We must value the music. Without the music, there is no, no, nothing to play with the horn. Without the music, there are no music students to teach. We must value the music. Now, with that, um, what many Americans do not know, and I believe it is a failure of the uh, education system, if you ask most Americans when our first copyright law was passed, they'll say maybe in the 1920s, maybe the 1930s. The reality is the first copyright law was passed in 1790. It was part of the original Constitution. I contend, and uh, I, I, I don't hear our history teachers, I don't hear our philosophers saying this, so, so please allow me a little latitude. I contend that the great American experiment here in our country, how we went from a ragtag group of, of British and Spanish and French colonies in the 1700s here uh, to uh, United States of America with 50 states and a world superpower and did that in a little over 200 years was not by accident. I believe it was by design because I believe that our founding fathers understood that if we value intellectual property, we can get the great thinkers and creative minds of the world to come here. And they did in droves. Architects, scientists, musicians, artists, they all came to the United States of America an architect goes, you mean if I design this building and I, I can copyright my architectural plans and if somebody wants to replicate that, they're going to have to, they're going to, have to license this or buy uh, the rights to do that from me? Yes, I'm going to America. You think about that and then look at the other superpowers of the world and think how many millennia it took them. So the copyright law has been with us for a very long time. The copyright law, though, is designed to seek a balance between intellectual property creator and user, intellectual property owner and user, and that is in the original Constitution, a balance between the two of them. There is a line between the two of them. However, I also believe, I believe that the law, for particularly in education, the law needs to be changed. I believe this. I believe that there needs to be some, some changes in the way we use our copyrights and, and the, the, the types of licensing and particularly the price points that are involved. However, we can't change a law until we all agreed to abide by the law. And I'll let that hang in awkward silence for a second there. If we abide by the law and then we work together, we can then work for new legislation to get a better balance between intellectual property owners, creators, and users. Now, let's go to my lifetime. And because I've been in publishing now for about 40 years, here I am, I start teaching. I start, I was a band director, a high school band director, literally at 18 years old in a private school, as Carol shared with you. It's 1977. 
and I am literally uh, uh, a high school band director. Well, at that time, media was not part of our lives. Media was record companies, and you had to go to the motion picture. You had to turn on the television, television stations, motion picture companies. The closest thing we had to media was being able to take a cassette recorder out and make a recording, and Lord knows the quality of that wasn't very good, so we weren't doing much with that. So media in our daily operations, wasn't, it wasn't really an, an issue. The ability to share that really wasn't an issue. Fast forward now to through the digital age, the digital millennium that is upon us. We've gone through another renaissance. This is the second renaissance, in my opinion. Starting with Gutenberg's printing press, here we are in the 1600s. All of a sudden now, the intellectual property creator could create something put it in a form of media and share it around the world and people could consume and use that without the creator having to be there. Now, fast forward, here we are in our time and day now, we can create something, notate it and hit a button, hit a send and it can be literally around the world in a fraction of a second. So we're in a new renaissance, it's moving faster than light speed we can transmit that digital media across the world faster than that beam of light would probably be able to travel or at least be close. So we've got, we've got some significant uh, opportunities with this, but we have some significant challenges with this. Uh, I believe that uh, social media clearly is, is, is driving a lot of our society right now. And, uh, and we cannot say that social media is not commercial. We can't say that. Uh, that uh, there, there are, are there's a lot of money that is exchanging hands, and and media is being used, music is being used, visual art is being used, copyrighted works are being used, and it is frankly it's a wild west out here, right now. I believe we as educators have a responsibility to value what we teach. I believe that we as educators have a responsibility to teach our students responsibility to, and and the, and to abide by the law. I don't think that we should pick and choose our laws. No, please don't murder somebody, but go copy that part for me. We've got to be careful. In the words of John M. Long, my teacher, he literally said to me as I, in the 70s, Robert, I don't care if you steal a dime or $10 million, you're still a thief. Do the right thing. He was right. And, I, and this is in the 70s, I'm a young undergrad. I had no idea how those words would resonate in, in particularly in these years now. So I urge all of us to make sure that we abide by the law. We have, a, we have to teach, we have a responsibility to teach our students to abide by the law. We also, however, have a responsibility to make sure that our school systems, our administrators, understand the value of what we bring into that community. Let's go to the football game. There are tickets being sold. There are uniform, there are athletes playing. You know what, there's band students playing. The uni uniform companies, they're, they're buying uniforms, concessions, but yet we're using the music oftentimes without any compensation. It's just only a couple of pennies if we do it. Only a couple of pennies. So we, uh, we've got, we've got a, a, an issue with making sure that we make sure that our administration, our school systems understand what the law is and appropriate use of copyrights. Now our theater colleagues have done a pretty good job. Think through your school systems and your maybe spring musicals. They will pay thousands of dollars to rent the books for a period of time. They've got the scripts, they've got the music books, they receive them on this date, here's their performance dates, and then the books must be returned then. And we're used to, schools are used to paying ten, fifteen thousand dollars yet we're, we're shuddering at thought of spending ten to fifteen thousand dollars on band literature, or orchestra literature a year, aren't we? And the difference is we get to keep it and we can play it anytime because when you buy that legal copy you're getting permission to perform live. Now what is happening is we've gone because of digital media, we've gone the way of, of popular music and now that permission to perform often now in most band situations only last through the end of the football season. If you want to play it again next year, you're going to have to pay again. If we had made this system of printed paper work, 
with the implied permissions, everything would be fine. Synchronization is yet something that is different. To affix music and sync it to a visual image is a different license than permission to arrange and permission to perform. Yep. When you buy the printed chart, the arrangement is what it is. You can make minor adjustments as you need and you have permission to perform it. But if you're gonna put it to video, you're gonna broadcast it in any way, and yes, social media is a broadcast, then that requires a synchronization license. Many publishers, including mine, particularly during the pandemic, have said, educators, I give you rights. You don't even have to ask. You can use this on your social media. But now education has caught the attention of the rest of the world of media. That is a two double-edged sword, because I believe as they catch the attention, they're gonna see how we have been woefully uncompliant for many decades. So I think that we all need to come together in the music ed community value what we teach, comply, and then make sure that we're uh, uh, informing everybody, including our administrations, what the real cost of this is. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. It's such an important topic. I appreciate your speaking on that. And I'll hand it back to Ms. Carroll. Thank you, Robert. I have a question from uh, one of our, our guests in Arizona, Mr. Robert Rudy, uh, that Hi, Robert. segues perfectly in with what Rich had just asked you about. And and his basic question is, how can we encourage publishers to release some of the older compositions that are now out of print? And he's asking because he has students that have never heard of or played some of the fantastic band music, say the 50s and the 60s, music that inspired him to be a band director and, and to love music. And he wants them to experience the same music, but he can't get it. And um, so how can we get the publishers to, to bring some of the permanently out of print pieces back? How can we use them legally? That, that is a, a great question. Thank you, Robert, for asking that. This is where, and again, Rich's question regarding uh, uh, copyright. This is where digital, the digital world works for us. Yeah. Because uh, the only thing stopping a publisher from putting it back into print and, and sellable is simply a demand for it. Because all it takes is scanning, digitizing it once, and now it sits in our digital presses. For example, my company, RWS Music, and I'm distributed by America's second oldest publisher, that's CL Barnhouse out of Oskaloosa, Iowa. They've been in business since 1886. You know, they started with offset presses, but I gotta tell you, there is a state of the art digital press sitting at Barnhouse right now. The orders are keyed in, and literally at night, while the employees are home, those presses print that stuff, collate it, and it's ready to be shipped the next morning. So once it's digitized for the first time, it sits in that system. And yes, it's now okay to only sell one or two copies. The problem was before, the reason they went out of print, and I spent so many years in the, in the business, it had to do with the cost of warehouse space. And when you're dealing in print and paper and big skids of print and paper, if something didn't sell a certain amount of copies, it was not, you didn't get a return on that space. You had to replace it with something that was gonna sell more copies. Now, as long as there is a good clean copy, it can be digitized and then ready on demand. So that, that is before us. So it requires us, and this is where if we would agree to value what we teach and comply with the law, if, we're, if we want to go back and grab something from the 60s or the 50s that is out of print, and we want to pull it back in, there's enough people to maybe want to do that as opposed to just photocopy and, and share, then all of a sudden that will be the impetus for that publisher to digitize it, put it in their system, and it'll be ready whenever we need it. So it's a great question. The technology now works for us in that area, but it's going to require us to create demand by complying by the law, complying with the law. Is this a matter of um, picking up the phone and calling a publishing house and having a discussion, or sending an email? Yeah, well, they, they hear from you, enough. I will tell you, uh, CL Barnhouse, which is a significant catalog. We're talking, I mean, this goes back again, 1886. We're talking Carl King's. Uh, we're talking, you know, John Philip Sousa was in Oskaloosa, Iowa, all right? And so 
Everything that has ever been in print at Barnhouse is available. When they get a request, they simply go to the, the archives, pull it, digitize it, print it, and go. It is available. So pick up that phone, Carol, as you just said, and call yeah. that publisher. Now I see the seeds of a project in here. See where my mind is going. Mm. I cannot believe that we're closing in on an hour here. So I'm going to rapid fire a couple of quick questions, and then I'm going to ask you one good one to wrap it up. I, I could, we could ask questions for another hour easily, and I'm sure you could tell stories for even twice that long, and we would still want to listen, but in respectful of everybody's time. Um, tell me, of all your compositions, which now, what's, what's the total now the, of compositions? Do you have a number? Uh, well, it depends on if you count all the books and everything else, but I'm, I'm in terms of publications, I'm over a thousand. Yeah, it's a crazy number. So of the pieces, the original music that you've written over the years, so we think like Beethoven, you were talking about the, the Diabelli variations. Think hundreds of years from now, you know, you get your symphony number no. five, your moonlight sonata, the pieces. Beethoven wrote thousands of things that none of us have ever heard of, but those things, the cream that rose to the top is still being played. What of your pieces would you like to be the ones that are still being played, the ones that live on 200 uh, years from now? That's a great question. For music's sake uh, and music only sake, I, I would hope and maybe the Divine Comedy would be there, the four movements of the Divine uh -huh. Comedy. That's, uh, that's played so often, uh, even to this day in the United States, but in Europe it's played regularly. I, I, yeah. it, it, that takes me to Italy on a very regular basis to go over and make guest conducting appearances. And, and I find that, that uh, now I'm so far removed from the composition that, uh, that it touches me in a different way. And uh, so, so I think that one, uh, I, I hope that will still be here. Uh, I also have just completed a setting of my mother's favorite hymn, and it's brand new, so you haven't heard it yet. It's gonna get played at the Midwest this year, and it's How Great Thou Art. And, and it's simple, it's poignant, uh, but I believe, I believe with every fiber of my being, it's very, very beautiful, and it is something that is, that is simple that any band can play but the lyricism inside that, it, the teaching opportunities are great. But just when I listen to that, I can hear my mother singing, and it's simply called A Mother's Hymn. So I think that's important. I also, though, however, find that something like The Tempest, The Tempest still sits at or near the top of the bestsellers lists every year in terms of pieces for very young band. Mm -hmm. And there's something about The Tempest that still connects with young children. And I got to oh, yeah. tell you, it's so amazing to me to go stand, you know, I was conducting a, 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 a Tanglewood with the musicians of the Boston Symphony. We're doing the Boston Pops uh, brass at Tanglewood kind of thing. And, and I still had a, 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 a fine special musician to come up and say, you know, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you in the Tempest. I went, now this, I, I, I can, I love this. And so I'm hoping that the Tempest will continue to connect with generations of, of young students because it is in those young students that is the music of our future. And what we do as educators, what you do folks as educators, everybody stands on your shoulders. Look at that incredible music industry and realize that it all begins with you. It has to be so satisfying. So you have a, a, someone come up and say that. What's on your bucket list? Is there something that, um, art-wise as a composer that you want to do b before your time is up or is there some other experience some other you're you're so um diverse and, and i wouldn't say jack of all trades but maybe you need to do so many things it's, what's on your bucket list i uh i love to connect with people and uh, i i've been fortunate enough to conduct on every continent except for antarctica and Africa. I regularly go to all the other continents and I love to connect with people. My bucket list though, however, is to continue that travel and connect with people in real and meaningful ways and then to describe that through music. And I keep a list, it's on my phone actually because the phone is always with me. And unfortunately there are not enough years for the list I even have right now. You know, and so I have to prioritize that list. I was so impacted this sum, this summer. I did a, a spend a COVID summer. I was supposed to be in Taiwan, concert tour in Taiwan, but I traveled the eastern part of the country, 
and I was standing there at Ellis Island for the first time. My, my, my goal this summer, my bucket list thing was, I wanna stop and see and smell and hear and feel and taste. I wanna to touch all the senses in these places that I've been rushing by and flying over and driving by my entire life. I gotta tell you, standing there in the hallowed halls of Ellis Island and hearing those voices of the past, and that's right at the top of my list right now. I was so inspired uh, by that. I love sculpting in sound, but it's not my sculpture that is the true art. The art is the connection with the musician and the audience. That's the art. And I hope that all of us in music will recognize that it is with that connection with our fellow human beings that gives value to what we do. And again, with a different slant, we must value what we teach. We must value that connection. That's a perfect segue into what will unfortunately have to be probably my last question. Um, here we are 18 months into this crazy pandemic that none of us could ever have imagined. And when it first happened in, in the, you know, the first few months, some summer a year ago, you were out in front quickly cheerleading and encouraging and um you were out there and i remember that we had you here with asba to come and speak when zoom was still we still weren't quite sure how all that worked and we had you come and and speak to us about how were we going to manage what were we going to do well here we are 18 months later and, and we all are doing this better than we did whether we like it or not um looking at it at this point how do you think things have gone and are there things particularly in school music and what we do that you think will change forever because of what we've been through what what, what is your take on it now looking back where are we going yes. yep i um i uh am thankful that i uh was fortunate to have a platform to be able to go out and and, and start uh, standing on the soapbox to alert, help alert teachers and prepare for what was coming. Because frankly, I, I thought, and I understand, I have been in that classroom many, many years, and I'm not talking about from a college pr professor standpoint, I'm talking about that classroom teacher teaching elementary, middle school, high school. I know what that feels like. And sometimes we're that proverbial ostrich in the sand or we've got on blinders and we can't see what is coming. I thought my job was to help people understand what is coming not what may be coming what is coming there were those that that did not see it there were those that frankly i got some i got some pretty interesting uh emails and 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 communiques from you know uh, uh saying that hey you're 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 chicken little here you're barking up the wrong tree uh i am thankful that i and some others did this and there were many many others that jumped uh, jumped into the fray here um with that in mind, I think overall, we've done a pretty good job as music teachers. Uh, we have learned to adapt in very meaningful ways. Our composers, our publishers have hopped on the flexible arrangement uh, idea. We've, we've adapted so many things there uh, so that we can still keep music going because once we lose it, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to lose something, but it's impossible to get it back in many cases. And so we have to remember that. We have to keep music um, relevant in our students and communities daily lives we can never forget that now though we've we've adapted and we've done pretty well uh, and we had to do it overnight we literally as teachers had to do this overnight you know surprise and you've got to be teaching tomorrow in a, in a in a video environment that you've never experienced before we did as a as a group we did very very well all things considering however we also need to realize that our world, in my opinion, is now forever changed. It is forever changed. And we may never get back to what we were prior to the pandemic. There are gonna be things that stay with us forever. There's some positive things. This environment win right now, we're, we are communicating, again, at light speed, aren't we? Like I was talking earlier. We're sharing ideas and thoughts and feelings at, at light speed. This could have never happened before. Uh, and, and, and it's just amazing how information is shared now. At the same time, our students have changed. And I think that we have some challenges. Number one, I think that we have to, as teachers, give ourselves a little bit of a break for our students and realize that their 
social emotional well-being is really important and not trying to necessarily make the primary goal to meet 2019's benchmarks because there are students right now that are so challenged with the the experience or lack thereof because of the past two academic years we have to give them a bit a break and I think that our goal we should measure our success by the enthusiasm of our students and our classrooms being full we need students in seats students in seats if we have them there we will adapt I think that we also have got to look I'm going to talk to band directors for a second here this is the ASBDA I think that we have to look at even the repertoire uh, the music must connect meaningfully in their daily life if you're teaching in an environment where they're listening to R&B and hip hop, incorporate it. You can teach with R&B and hip hop. And, and if you're not sure, contact me. I will help you and give you some thoughts because I have taught using R&B and hip hop. You know, if we're, if we have to, if we're, I've had this discussion with Carol in, in past years about country music or folk music and doing that in the, in the, in the classroom. We don't necessarily have to live with just a European model here. I don't think that is going to be the answer. I think that we must diversify our repertoire. We must diversify those that bring the music to the repertoire so that we're, we're teaching and using all voices. That is what's gonna keep us relevant and allow us to teach with rigor, rigor and relevance. I tell my students that my goal for them is for them as musicians to be able to hear where other people may not know to listen. Teachers, we've got to hear. We've got to hear our communities. We've got to hear our students where we've never listened before. We've got to go to them, connect. And if we connect, they will follow us wherever we want to go. But we have to go to them first. I also want our teachers and our students to be able to see where they might not have known to even look. And we've got some challenges. We've got a very small beginning band class from the past two academic years. That wave is gonna work its way up to our high schools. And I gotta tell you, when the world is gonna see it is gonna be in college bands because most of those big giant college marching bands are freshmen and sophomore. And all of a sudden there's gonna be two contiguous years of fewer band students you're gonna see college bands in a couple of years be much smaller. We have to accept that as aftershocks and, and additional waves of our COVID tsunami and realize that in order to do that, we have to make sure that we're hitting it head on like the captain steering the boat into that, into that wave. We have to hit it head on. If it broadsides us, we're going down. We have to hit it head on and we know that there's fair seas on the other side. This has been such a great hour. It's gone by so quickly. And I can't thank you enough for being our guest. I'm reminded talking to you when I, when I first met Robert W. Smith, my first thought was this is the most down to earth guy I've ever met. And he's brilliant. And he is pretty creative thinking, generates new ideas as fast as the rest of us, you know, inhale and exhale. And I'm reminded listening to you now that at the core of all the many things you are, master teacher, master teacher is right in there. And, and I, I think you would be as successful teaching first graders as you would teaching college seniors, music industry or whatever. I have no doubt about that. You are a master teacher Thank you. at your, at your heart. And um, you've done so much for education and for music education. And, uh, and I know you're not done yet. There's, you're, you're too excited. I can tell. You're so excited about life and, and everything. So. Can I share one other item with you? Yeah. Yeah. This Sunday, October 24th, is my birthday. So, you know, here I am. I'm going to turn 63. And being a teacher for many years, you know, I've always told my students, you know, they say, oh, thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And I, I'm very grateful for that. But I tell them, look, I appreciate that more than you'll ever know. But I want you to pay it forward. So 40 years ago, I had a couple of guys in my, in my band and they called me about a year, year and a half ago and a couple years ago actually, and said, uh, we're taking your words to heart and we're starting a foundation for music education and we're gonna name it after you. 
So this Sunday is going to be the launch of the Robert W. Smith Foundation for Music Education. Oh, wow. So uh, uh, look for it on Facebook. Look, it on, look for it on social media. And uh, some of the things we talked about here tonight. These two gentlemen, by the way, one, uh, Derek Watson, uh, played clarinet in my band. But he also, he was brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And uh, uh, wanted to play in the drum corps, so he learned to play trumpet and then played in drum corps. And those of you that follow drum corps, he was in my 1986 Suncoast Sound horn line. Uh, he was really, that's a, that was a pretty fair line. Uh, the very special people. And uh, so clarinet player that did that. Now he's Dr. Derek Watson, lives in Columbia, South Carolina, and he is a uh, renowned surgeon and uh, uh, hospital administrator and saves so many people every single day. The other one is Jeremy Morris, one of the best improvisation students I ever had and so incredibly creative. But what he does is he does nonprofits uh, for a living. He's worked with things like the American Cancer Society and Relay for Life. All right, so I know you probably have heard of that. Oh, well, that's Jeremy Morris. So this Sunday, the Robert W. Smith Foundation for Music Education uh, kicks off. So I'd urge you and, and, and those viewing, uh, go to that uh, foundation website. Uh, if you go there now, there's a little countdown. Uh, but there'll be a little video presentation and some pretty interesting things. Uh, and then I invite you to engage uh, your constituency, engage, your, engage your, your band parents. I want to get instruments in the hands of children. I want to get music education opportunity to every kid, not just deserving kids, every child. Help us, help us share your voice with a child so they can find their voice. And then together, collectively, we can raise our voices. What an incredible honor that is to you and, and so deserving. I can't wait to see how, see it come out and, and see where it goes. I know it'll be greatly successful. You'll have to send me a little something and then I'll forward it on to our ASPDA members and others as well. Okay. I okay. want to thank our ASPDA members here, Bill, Kathy, Chris and Rich for being part of our panel tonight to talk with Robert and um, I will have to just continue this sometime. There's lots more to talk about. So Robert, any anytime you call me, I'm let's get together there again. ASBDA, sometime. Always there. You have such a great supporter of, of ASBDA and music teachers and music education in general. I don't think um, it would be it would be hard to top the enthusiasm and, and support and care you have for all of us. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank and you. folks at home, thank you for joining us tonight. The video of tonight's um, interview will be on our ASBDA YouTube channel in pretty soon, 24 or 48 hours, something like that. And um, I'm lots to learn from it. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, all. Thank you. Good night.